Okay, so let me preface this by saying that this is a uh, uh, interactive demo, which means it's it's essentially screenshot walkthroughs of the environment, uh, but it gives a good depiction of uh, the capabilities and so forth. So there's a whole bunch of workflows that have been put together by our technical marketing engineers so that we can walk through and see these different use cases and so forth. So let's just take a look at the VM backup and recovery section. So let's start with something simple. We'll go through each of these walk work workflows of uh, protecting VM. So when we come in, we this is essentially you're logging into Power Protect Data Manager. So this is um, this is where you'd log in, and this is where you'd be uh, logging into that software-defined piece, uh, piece of software that's our OVA that's sitting in the VM environment, or you'd be logging into the X400 appliance with this with this interface. And when you first get here, you'll see that you have your initial spa screen and it's, it's single out as two panes. There's a left pane for your, to manage your infrastructure. And there's also the middle pane that'll do all our actions. But for this particular workflow, we're gonna concentrate on uh, protecting a VM. So we're gonna add a, we're gonna add something called an asset source. So when we talk about in the in PPDM or Power Product Data, Data Manager, when we say an asset, we're talking about essentially a client. And an asset is essentially data that exists in your environment, and we, we protect protect it as an asset. So we're going to add a vCenter here. So we le we leverage vCenter to reach out into the environment and uh, discover which VMs reside in the different within the VM e ecosystem. So we'll add credentials. And then we also have something with our vSphere plugin. So this is a plugin that uh, satisfies uh, the, I, the VI admin persona, and it allows you to do uh, recovery and FLR or file level recovery operations from the vCenter UI itself. Uh, there's a different workflow. We can, we can take a look at that as well if we have time. So now what we have is if we look at the left pane, we have our asset source, which is our vCenter. So you can see there's other, and a, a small disclaimer, this is a, a, a 19.3 version of uh, PowerProtect, I think we're looking at as part of this demo. Uh, but, uh, we're just getting ready to GA our 19.5 release as well. So that it, things will look a little bit different. There's more workloads added, more supportability and, and those incremental changes that we bring to our customers. So let's take a look at this. And this is the discovery process. So this is Power Protect saying, I wanna reach out to vCenter and discover the entire VM infrastructure and all those assets or VMs and VMDKs that are sitting in behind the scenes. Let's go figure out what those are. So this is just a manual discovery for the sake of this lab, but uh, this, this is run automatically in the background as well. So we can see here, see here that we discovered our discovery status is okay. We last discovered it just now. So now when we come to our assets, and again, that's gonna be our VMs that we're talking about. Uh, we can see all our virtual machines that exist here. You can see here's all our other workloads that are separated as well. Um, so our protection engine, this is what we uh, hey, we're build up this. Wait a second. Up this, wait a second. <laughs> so all the other assets were virtual assets or they are other ab assets that power the data manager is protecting? Uh, yes. So there's, uh, these are other assets that uh, power protect data, man data manager supports and you would be protecting as well. So the same okay. type of discovery thing happens for these asset types as well. So it'll reach out to the environment, figure out uh, what you have as assets for these categorized types of assets. You can see the list, Kubernetes, SAP, HANA, VMAC, VMAX, file systems, SQL databases, oracles, and, and virtual machines. This, this particular workflow is focused on the, the VMware side, but most only the same type of uh, discovery happens elsewhere. Thanks. Duncan, sorry. Why did you start with a, with a, there was a first, uh, screen where you selected virtual machines, and now uh, when you start. Sorry, Enrico, repeat that. I didn't, I didn't catch that. Yeah, yeah, in, at the very beginning of the presentation the, of the demo, you started selecting virtual machine backup, and now I see all the resources in uh, all the tab resources here. 
it's confusing again. So wh why? Oh, yeah. Uh, that so was just an initial splash screen. Sorry? That was just an initial splash screen when you first launch the UI, if you've never launched it before. It's yeah. just something that something to get you started in the application. But most certainly, the, the uh, you would do the same type of setup and configuration for these other ones. There's workflows that we have for those. I, I don't know for the sake of time we'll have a chance to go through all those. But this is just an example of of walking through the VM side. It's it, obviously there's nuances. We have to add uh, vCenter into it for the sake of discovery. Uh, but something similar happens with our other asset types as well, or other uh, uh, types of workloads that we cover. Okay. So as part of the VM infrastructure, we have to deploy a proxy so that we can have that proxy sitting within the VM infrastructure as our data mover. So we'll just go through a bunch of host name and credentials and how we want to configure that particular proxy to, to live in the VM infrastructure. So if I'm already in the Dell EMC, like I'm already using Dell EMC storage, is there any ability to do storage backups or storage snapshot backups? Are you, are, and Becky, are you talking about outside of VMware to do storage? I don't know, from, from, from Power Protect. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll answer that. So, okay. I mean, we, you know, if it's just general storage, we can back up general storage. So we're, we're storage agnostic. Um, where the, the value comes in terms of our own integration with, with um, like PowerMax or PowerStore um, is our ability to manage those snapshots um, and get better efficiency um, of, of, of data movement between, between that array and the backup target. And over time, what you'll see is we'll get, you know, we'll get, we'll expand our, um, our support at that level for other arrays as well. Okay, thanks, Darren. So we deployed the proxy within our vCenter and we'll just see it loading here is deploying the OVF. So it deploys our proxy in the VM infrastructure. When we come back to the data manager UI, we can see it being deployed and it gives us a little status to, to indicate that we're, we're good. You can filter by that as well if you're deploying multiple proxies. So the next thing we're going to do is, is configure policy. So this is how we're going to define uh, the governance around our data protection. So we're going to add a policy. We're going to give it a, a, a cosmetic name for that policy. We're going to protect our virtual machines. Uh, we're, going to we're going to stick with crash consistent as opposed to app aware because we're not talking about SQL in this particular equation. So here's where we'll find, we're just gonna pick a, I think for the sake of this demo, it just targets a single VM. Now we're gonna add our backup and we're gonna define how often and, and how long we wanna keep this, this uh, assets data for. Okay, so I'm gonna go a little, you, sorry. You select okay. the VM, but uh, I have not to select uh, folder tags uh, and potentially uh, you can have tags uh, also in other elements. Uh, yeah, uh, so this is one particular view that exists for selecting assets, okay. like particularly in a, in a vCenter infrastructure. In our 19.5 release, we're going to have an entire hierarchy view where you'll be able to select uh, at the container level, like the, at the, the host level, a resource pool, any type of container levels. So if your VMs reside within a single uh, container, you can just select that, that particular container and everything within that particular container will be protected. So as VMs move in and out dynamically, they'll automatically be, be protected by that single container selection. So this here is just a, a simplicit, simplistic, uh, flat asset view. If you have, if you want to granularly pick one specific asset or a VM, but most certainly there is there is another view that's outside of this demo that that'll let you allow you to select. It's like almost like a one to one uh, relationship between what you see in B Center versus what you would see in this UI, so you you can understand what you're selecting. Okay, and about the proxy. 
Uh, I guess that you have uh, a map uh, or a best practice uh, how many proxy you need uh, uh, for uh, each environment. But uh, isn't better to make this uh, somehow automatically that uh, in the inventory you discover all the machine, you see that uh, you have, uh, for example, uh, multiple data store, you maybe need uh, a proxy for each data store or for each cluster uh, and uh, uh, drive automatically the the right building of the cluster, the number the the, the number of the proxy that you need uh, to back up your VM. Oh, I so, see what you're getting. So you're referring to this the auto management of proxies within an environment, yeah. so that you can scale up and scale down as you need exactly. based on the and number also of VMs. Spin and, up and spin down because maybe you don't want to deploy every time, but you can power off, power on the proxy when you need, and so on. Yeah, and that's something that we're evaluating from the power protect perspective. Laura kind of alluded to some initiatives that we have going on with VMware. So we wanna make sure we balance what we uh, put into the product today, because we're gonna be enabled, it's enabling some uh, really great initiatives in the future. So we don't have that. What you're describing, we don't have that that yeah. auto um, rollout of proxies based on the size of your environment and to dynamically grow and shrink the number of proxies you need in, in an environment. It is a manual operation. There, there's a lot of hands off. You just you're just uh, like the one screen we saw where you define the IP and the host name and where you yeah. want to deploy the proxy. That that's the manual part of it. Uh, okay. But most certainly the load balancing and where your, your data is being protected, there's automation underneath the covers so that um, it'll, it'll push that, those proxies as data movers. Will, uh, there's logic so that based on where things live within the VM infrastructure, within your data stores, those proxies will be leveraged uh, logically within the environment so that you're, you're moving data correctly. Okay. Yeah, but it's and, definitely uh, something we're definitely looking at that. Okay. Um, and, uh, that uh, dynamic automated proxies. And then we're going to have, I mean, this isn't the only area of the product where we use proxies. Um, so NAS support is another, another area as an example, right? So having a concept of even getting into a universal proxy, right? So there's, you're not managing different types of proxies. Um, but they're a great question. Okay. No. okay. And uh, for your specific uh, storage, uh, uh, are you looking also to, to have some kind of uh, native uh, transfer uh, uh, without uh, the needs of uh, VMware uh, proxy uh, or, uh, or just to initiate the, the snapshot and the operation, but then transfer from, uh, for example, a storage snapshot like uh, Becky has uh, asked before. Are you looking for this in the future? Go ahead, Duncan. Yeah, so the, the, we do have initiatives uh, like uh, joint in engineering initiatives with VMware that um, we're looking to solve particular use cases for our customers when it when it, it comes to scenarios like that. So it's a little bit early and things are things are coming, but uh, just not today. So I don't know if I can really describe it today, but uh, they are coming. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Let me just uh, keep pressing on through our demo so we can cloud tier if we like. We need a minimum of 14 days uh, for compliance. But I think we actually back out of this, so let's just get rid of this. So here, we. this is where we'll change timing. We could set storage quotas if we like. And this is where we'd select our data domain. So this is um, because this would be the non X400 flavor of PPDM. This is just PPDM, the software uh, stack version. We'd select the DDVE or physical DD that's in our environment to, to push our data to. And if we want to, we could set up replication so we could go to uh, a secondary location off-site or, or near line. Just to set up some of the configuration items. So now we, we'd select the other data domain system as part of this. It's the, the other two that's part of this. 
Which protocol are you using uh, for uh, that domain? Are you using DDBoost? Yeah, all, all DDBoost, yeah. You just manage file replication when we're, we're replicating from, from data domain A to B. Okay. And then we finish off our policy. And this is just this, the job screen that shows us our jobs that's running. Duncan, I have a question. Yep. When did you release the first version of this product? So PPDM 19.5 is releasing uh, any day now. So it started at uh, 19. About the first. So what I see here. July, July of last year. July last year. Thanks, Darren. Sorry, what I see here, uh, and uh, just to be very honest, is nothing really special. I mean, it's something that we can find from any backup vendor, Veeam and, and others. And, and now, even then, they change it the way they organize backups, okay? So many of them are thinking more about SLAs, no more about backup jobs. So they, they, they change it a lot of, of these paradigms, whole paradigms, and move to new paradigms for VMs and even 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 more for containers, they're organizing the, the VMs in applications and things like that. I, I'm not seeing at, at this stage of the presentation, none of it. So I think, why did you choose a very traditional model and not something really you know, new for this uh, kind of operation? I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but, but I don't uh, see any Yeah, of this. I, I won't say you're, you're wrong, but uh, I mean, we, I could probably spend a couple of days on going through the different facets of Power Protect and the feature set that it holds and the way we manage data. It, and like you said, through SLA, there's a whole SLA facility within Power Protect. So those kind of things there exist. I think that the goal of this, the short interactive demo is just to get the look and feel of, of protecting one of our workflows. But most certainly, I mean, the UI is very simple to look at. It may seem simplistic. And that was the goal that we're going for is ease of use of Power Protect. But also, uh, don't let the, the UI fool you because there, there is quite a bit of depth to the application as far as, as managing our data. So, uh, it, Dun Duncan, can I just add to um, Enrico's comment, actually? Sure. So, um, what you're showing here on the screen is very much you're talking about assets, you're talking about hardware, you're talking about physical entities, even if they might be virtualized like virtual machines. Um, as we move forward into the cloud uh, era with containers where the container that holds the application will become more and more ethereal and the thing we want to protect and keep over a long piece of time is the data. You're still showing backups based on those legacy constructs of virtual machines and servers and so on. I, d I don't see how this is going to fit with a cloud environment where I could be running a container on one machine and then on another. I could have an application that's constri contrived of many different components that come together, including, for example, a file system or an object store that's not associated with a specific VM or anything like that. So I need a totally different view on the data than the one I already have. But you're showing me this old sort of physical construct view. So how are you going to change to be more application focused in the way you present this data? Yeah, I think I think that's part of the interactive demo is just something to give you guys the look and feel. Um, but you're most certainly right. It is very it is very narrowed as far as what we're seeing is, is part of this demo. But most certainly as we dive into those cloud use cases and managing that data, because it could be anywhere, it could be on-prem, it could be edge, it could be cloud. Yeah. Uh, that's where we're developing to make sure that we're managing that data correctly. Okay. So, I mean, the views we're seeing here are very, like I said, they're very narrowed. It doesn't give you a good depiction of the whole story. Uh, but it's kind of the best we could do with the, the time that we had. Okay, but just as a just as a follow up to that very quickly, um, what what we're seeing here is assets that seem to exist at the current time. Now, 
there may be assets that were used to deploy an application that was sitting in one location one day and then another day it was somewhere else so i was running it in the hybrid in a hybrid environment running it in public cloud and then that, the next day I, I put it somewhere else so there's a timeline factor to this that says when this application was running last week it ran in this cloud and this week it's now running on prem so I need to know where it was at the time in order to work out which restore point is the one from the right platform. Again, I don't see that timeline or that historical view in what you're showing us or in the way that you're setting up the data protection. So I think there's a lot of stuff that needs to go in to change this to be more cloud focused or at least more distributed and hybrid focused. Yeah, and, and you're not wrong about what we're seeing here. It's just the, this is um, you can see what we're seeing here is this is the, the this particular assets backup copies and where they reside. So if you had copies that resided in cloud or if they resided on a secondary DD, you would get that picture as we went along here. I think the the workflow that we're going through, like I said, it's very narrow, unfortunately. So um, we're not really. It's not really coming through through the UI that you're that I'm presenting to you to you right now. Okay. Yeah. So Chris, you know, one of the things that you know, as Duncan mentioned, there there's a lot of capability uh, within this protection engine, um, and what we're showing, um, and a large part is to help our own customers when we go like when we talk about that policy. Um, conversion from Avamar to PowerProtect. So some of these concepts are still really, really important to our customers and partners. But as we move forward, um, you know, we have the ability to assign SLAs, but we're looking at how do we flip that around to have the SLA actually drive policy? So why don't you tell me what, as a business, what your objectives are from a protection um, your recovery point objectives, your recovery time objectives, regardless of where that data sits, um, provide you that visibility in terms of those points in time. Um, and you're actually going to see some of that reflected in the next release, uh, which is going to be a quarter from now. Um, and I, I actually want to sign you up for some UX work to have us give us some feedback because we're work <laughs> actually working on that, <laughs> that timeline concept right now. Um, is it's actually pretty cool. We're actually showing the different copies that are available point in time, where that was, um, how they moved. So some exciting stuff. But the underpinnings and the foundation of the tech is there. And we're building and exposing the capabilities and the workloads we're supporting over time and trying to do that being, being very conscious of our of our install base that we have so that we can move them forward without having this really disruptive experience. Yeah, I agree. It's a, it's a tough it's a tough um, balancing act. Yeah, but you know, it's all about is the opportunity to do something different to anybody else in the market. Yeah, it's always going to be hard. I, I appreciate that. Yeah, I mean, and I don't honestly when I look at, at the I've been in this business for a long time, and I look at the landscape of vendors um, that are in this space. Nobody has the capability that we have um, to do what we're trying to do. Like that has this incredible install base and great intellectual property, and then it's moving that install base forward um, while attracting new customers with our modern capabilities. So the things that we're doing in VMware, the things that we're doing in Kubernetes um, are, are, are really exciting. Um, and but in terms of breadth and depth and capabilities, yeah. Thanks, Laura. Um, sure. Yeah, nobody has those capabilities that we have. We, unmatched but you didn't talk about uh, uh, restores I mean uh, backup is just the beginning and uh, so uh, I expect that you have all the features that are available from you know other backup software like instant recovery from anywhere to anywhere and features like that right already implemented and uh, running yeah, absolutely. Um, everything you would expect. Um, so, you know, I think the one that, you know, all your traditional uh, capabilities, um, being able to restore from a copy, um, but our instant access capability is probably something that um, we want to highlight. And again, that that's really centered on our VMware capabilities and our uh, Kubernetes capabilities. And Duncan, do you want to highlight anything else from that? 
No, I think when you're talking about um, parity between products or other other competitors and so forth, um, most certainly with the type asset types that we support today, that the parity is there. We check all the boxes. So I think the the other half of it too is is where we're trying to innovate with Power Protect because it is we we do develop in an agile fashion. We bring bring things to market quite quickly. So it's it's not only just the parity stuff that we're we're making sure that we've taken care of, which we have, but it's also looking into the future for our customers. Is there any capabilities to test backups? So you've obviously got backup, you've got restore, but then you've got the bit in between where you want to know how successful your backups are actually being. Is there any testing capabilities, automated testing capabilities or anything like that? That is part of PowerProtect's roadmap. Um, within the next release or two is to look at, at least in the VMware side, is to do some um, sandbox testing against VMs so as a sanity check. Uh, that, that's something that is in our roadmap. It's not there today if that's if we're talking about the same thing. Uh, but as far as protecting the data, that's where we leverage data domain, data domain's own technology to make sure the data is secure. Did I answer that for you, Barry? Yep, yeah, it did. And in terms of tiering to the cloud, you're just using the data domain functionality that I've, I've seen that before as to how I could start by doing it on-premises, but then tear it off out to the cloud. You got yes. it. Yes, correct. Can you, can you talk a little bit on how you're, um, you you work in the Kubernetes environment? Um, it's you know it's operationally much more complex. And Chris mentioned about you know ephemeral data and, or ephemeral applications and that sort of stuff. How does this look in that sort of an environment? Um, how are you protecting those storage data assets? I'll call them. Yeah. So I think there's probably two. Uh, highlights there. So number one, uh, we are leveraging the Valero interface. Um, so there's they, there's a standard way of being able to protect other environments, and we're leveraging that interface. Um, and the second piece is as we start to see uh, what VMware is doing with Tanzu, um, being able to um, you know, manage the infrastructure, manage different Kubernetes grids, provide access to users, to teams, to those developers, um, and then how that extends into vSphere as well. Um, we are um, using all of those, those common interfaces, those tools, uh, in order to manage this Kubernetes environment. So does, so does Valero work outside of a, of a VMware? So you could... Could you could you deploy Power Protect Data Manager appliance, let's say, and protect a a, a Kubernetes pod um, that's outside of VMware? Uh, yes, we can. Um, and one, I know one of the things that Tanzu is trying to do is trying to become um, agnostic, right, to you know other you know non VMware Kubernetes deployments. Um, and so, not only we're working that, but we're working. Um, uh, just with the standard interfaces through those other distributions of Kubernetes. 